Hello and welcome to the Navy Blue Corner. I'm Ian, joined as always by my good mate Lockie. And there aren't really many better feelings than beating Essendon, particularly breaking their hearts after they have been building themselves up as a genuine contender and threat, which honestly no one believed that for a second. So oh, look, God. Lockie as well, mate. You strong start. messaged me, mate. You're talking about strong starts because you're the one who messaged me straight after the game. And I've got a bit of a quote here. I've written this down. You said, I'm going to go hard at the Bombers this week, I tell you. Genuine pretenders. So I'm going to, you know, do my best to hold you to that, Lockie. And, but I, before we get into that, how are you? And uh, are you going to get fired up for us all this evening? Feeling very good, mate. Very good. It was a great weekend. Uh, topped off very well with that win. The one thing I'll lead off with was just a, a tweet that I saw. It may have come across your feed as well, uh, where, where someone, uh, there was an Essendon fan talking about how they decided to listen to some Carlton content to see if they could get a balanced perspective of both sides. I'm not sure if you saw that one. Um, and, you know, they were like, oh, it wasn't balanced at all. They said that Essendon are pretenders, that kind of thing. And it's like, well, well. The proof's in the pudding, I would have thought. Oh, 100%. But look, Lockie, I am going to need you to fire up uh, today on this episode because as those that are listening and watching can probably tell by my voice, I am slowly recovering from COVID, which I'll be honest, I can't believe is still a thing in 2024, but apparently it is. And I will say True. it is not much more fun the second time around. Uh, I can tell you that for sure. But let's jump straight in and... We normally start at Navy Noise, but I kind of almost want to start with Media Meltdown because the fallout mm -hmm. of this game, Carlton jump to second on the ladder, go into the bye. How good is this? Another win under the <clears> belt, <throat> starting to really mount a case as the, the number two in the competition. You'd think that that would be the rhetoric, the storyline out of this win against Essendon. Apparently it's mm. not. Apparently it is that Essendon are better. They were just inaccurate. And and listening to people like Jonathan Brown saying, you know, they were the ones that impressed him, not Carlton. Feels like that's the narrative <laughs> out of this game. So I wanted to start by discussing this here with you, Lockie. And I want to get everyone's mm. thoughts to this. So if you're watching on YouTube, drop them in the comments. If you're listening in audio form, head over to the socials at Navy Blue Corner because Essendon on the stat sheet look like they potentially – got the better of us, 19 more inside 50s, 58 more uncontested possessions, four more marks inside 50, and 21 more tackles. They also had, you know, four more scoring shots. They were widely inaccurate in front of goal, kicking nine goals, 16 to our 15 goals, six. Is it as mm -hmm. simple as Essendon were the better team, but they just couldn't convert, maybe like we were saying, against Geelong a few weeks back, or are those stats yeah. deceiving? Yeah, it's a it's a complicated topic. Uh, I definitely think some of that was fueled by Brad Scott's comments in the presser, uh, which was quite an interesting uh, listen. I always enjoy hearing the opposition coaches after a loss against us. Um, so I guess there's a few ways that you can look at it. I mean, so often we try to add colour to these stats, like... An obvious one is a free kick transparency. Anyone that really thinks through a free kick transparency understands that there's a reason that, you know, that it's more than just what's on the surface, right? So I think a lot of those stats are you reeled off, like inside 50s, like, yeah, they did have a lot more inside 50s, but I, I don't think a lot of them were of the quality that ours were putting themselves into good positions, deeper inside 50s, those kind of things. So mm. I think the stats is only part of the story. I think one other comment I'll make, like if we, again, take the kind of step back, I, you know, we, we were haters on Essendon last week. I don't think Essendon are terrible. They're, they're not a bad team right now. I just don't see them as a genuine premiership contender. And we are. So it maybe you can look at it as, you know what, Essendon did give Carlton a good crack and maybe they could have got over the line if they were more accurate. And if they do that against a real contender, then then that's impressive. So that's my little tip to Essendon based on uh, your little intro. Yeah, interesting there because, look, you said you are going to go hard and you've somehow you put your Essendon cap on, <laughs> which I'm not impressed with. Don't enjoy the start something. of the podcast. But, no, I think, like, anyone rational, I was trying to make the case for them last week to be like, look, there, let's just not take them lightly was what I was hoping for. Yeah. But I think you've summarised that perfectly where, yeah, we 
we're one of those teams that have put down the credentials to be a genuine contender, to be the number two seed right now behind Sydney, who look current yep. form, clear, clearly the number one. They're putting a gap on everyone else. Um, Essendon are putting themselves into top eight contention, but needed to prove something. And I really yep. think the stats flattered them considerably. And, and I really wanted to look at, to start this off in their inaccuracy, because that's kind of been mm. where the conversation has gone from after this game. And you look at the 16 behinds they had, they actually only had 11 real misses in front of goal. The rest were rushed or touched on the line. So that's mm -hmm. 11 shots. Now I'm going to throw up a little bit of a graphic. So great if you're watching oh, on I YouTube, here on Blue Abroad, awful if you're in audio form, but feel free to head over <laughs> to the YouTube. Link's in the description in the show notes to, to get a look at this one, but I'll throw this up right now. Now, mm -hmm. the ones up the top are Eston's shots. The ones down the bottom are Carlton's in front of goal. Now, all of those little dots on your screen are misses. They are the behinds. And, and taking a look at where they're having mm. these shots from is the important thing. Well, and truly easy to say, hey, 11 misses, they should all be goals. But let's try and dive a little bit deeper and say, were you creating the most with those inside 50s? Did the ball just cross over straight to a Carlton player and then go out again? And that counts as an inside 50, even though it really wasn't an effective inside 50. So I want it to be a bit more balanced. And really, out of all those shots, Lockie, they're not from great areas. Mm -hmm. There's a few in there that are closer to goal, but most of them are really on the arc or, or on a wider angle. And so I'm going to show you this next little chart in which done a bit of Photoshopping. He's, he's colorized it for you now, Lockie. So <laughs> for the green, the green circles are what I'm classifying as a genuine, you should score from here. All the red are misses. Yeah. Now, if you're looking at this for Essendon, I would say that there are five clear yes opportunities there's a couple that maybe you can throw into this on the arc directly in front but i think as soon as you're starting to get to that 50 meters out that's when things it has become that little bit harder and comparing that to us i would almost say that our four chances were almost better than than their five chances so i just think it's mm -hmm. if we're going to be saying that essendon missed a lot and probably should have got them i think it's about diving deeper seeing where they took those shots from and then having a look at Carlton as well, because from those attempts from both teams, I'm kind of going to say split the difference. Both teams had good chances they both should have missed or should have gotten, sorry. Totally. I I really like this uh, a lot. I think another two things that come to mind based on your discussion of this is the context around this, which is obviously this was a high-pressure game, you know, like on the big stage, you like to think that we've had a bit more of that experience than them. So maybe that goes into it. And then think about the guys doing some of those misses as well. Like I, I don't want to call out individuals from opposition teams, but Nick Martin is notorious at the moment for his poor disposal by foot, even with Essendon fans. One of those was a Will Setterfield behind. Like, you know, yeah. It, it, there's so much nuance to all of this. It's, it's you know, it's the way it is. No. And the other thing is... And, it's like the whole what if thing. And, and we do this sometimes too. Well, what if we beat Adelaide? And if we just got over the line against Schlong, we'd be top of the ladder. There's a place for those like what ifs when you try to be optimistic. And if that's the way they want to do it and look at it that way, then then they mm. can do it. But we got the four points. Absolutely. And, and so much of where their poor conversion came down to for me was just the, the as that chart kind of depicts it's it's where we were allowing them to get those opportunities and even in the third sure. quarter which we'll touch on we'll go into more detail when they had their dominance mm -hmm. we weren't giving them easy looks we defended the ground really well and then when we're efficient when we're creating really good chances ourselves that builds that scoreboard pressure you start to miss one you miss a second one like how many times have we said yeah. just about Carlton when you 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 I feel like last year was the, was a big one when this was happening. We were getting those shots, you know, 40, 50 out wide yeah. on the boundary. You miss two or three of those. The opposition goes down and kicks one. It just builds that pressure. It's harder to then convert the next one. So I yep. think it's ridiculous to say that Essendon were the better team. Yeah, they won some stats, but I'm going to tell you some stats that Carlton won that I think are a little bit better Do than it. the uncontested possessions in inside 50s. We had... More clearances. We had three more center clearances. 
three more stoppage clearances. And we also scored more by three points from stoppages. So at the source, we were better. We also won contested possessions by 15. So clearly when the ball was there to be won, critical contests, we were number one. And they won those uncontested possessions, as I said, by 58. But what do you do with them? It's all well and good mm. having more of the ball but they struggled to move the ball from D50 and create from it. Essendon had 26 rebound inside 50s. That is the lowest out of every team for the round. While hmm. conversely, looking at us, we actually had the most um, for the round at 50 rebound inside 50. So we had less yeah. of the ball, but were way more efficient and effective in how we were transitioning and moving it. The way we defended did not allow Eston to do a lot with it. And we we're probably quite happy at times just to let them have the ball in wide spaces, have it in defense, because you're, you're clearly not doing a lot with it. And and overall, we were far from our best. I, I think that that's clear to Agreed. say. Our midfield in particular, uh, I think that Walsh uh, and Cripps were quite down, particularly Walsh. I, I thought he had a pretty yep. average game for his standards. We only really dominated half a quarter at the last quarter, and yet we held them at arm's length for the whole game and won pretty easily. So at the end of the day, I'm very happy that the media and all the attention, like I tweeted after the game, is that Essendon, it's all about them, all about their performance. Gee, they probably should have won this. It's all about them. We're, we're sitting pretty second spot on, la on the ladder. Pressure is completely off us going into the bye. I love it, Lockie. It's yeah, exactly right. I mean, we I know we'll reflect on it towards the end of this episode where we were three weeks ago, not feeling as positive. You know, we were trying to look at it optimistically, and you know, to to be in this position now, um, I think we all would have taken this. No, one hundred percent. Apologies for interrupting this episode, but I need to talk about our brand new merch. Yes. We have brand new tees for the 2024 season available now over on our big cartel. Links will be in the description of this episode and in the show notes. We've put a lot of work into the design, which you can see behind me if you are watching over on YouTube. Put a lot of effort into that and the quality of the tees to make sure that we give you guys the best product that we can so you can wear and show your support for not only the pod, but also the baggers. We've got limited sizes left, so make sure you get in quick before they sell out. I'd hate for you to miss out. And those watching on YouTube will be able to see the design on screen now. If you're listening in audio form, head over to our big cartel or our socials at navy blue corner to see the design a big thank you to everyone who has already purchased a tea your support means the world to give up your time to listen and watch us means absolutely everything and then for you to spend your hard-earned money supporting us i mean there's absolutely no words to describe that we're just forever grateful so yes that's gonna wrap up the little merch plug here grab a tea now before they sell out links will be everywhere you won't miss them back to the show so let's go to the Navy noise. And I wanted to talk about uh, team defense. This was one of my big kind of takeaways from this game where I think it was one because we've spoken a lot about that hashtag 75 from the great Timmy Dub. But mm. I think it really deserves a bit more of a review this week because I thought it was really that key to victory um, was, our, was our team defense. Not only just the, the ability to structure up to, to not allow those easy shots of goal that we mentioned previously, but it was the intent and the defensive intent to get to every single contest, to win it, yeah. to to even it. I, I thought that that was incredible. They defended that like their lives depended on it. I absolutely loved it. So that's three weeks in a yeah. row now that we've kept our opponents to under that magic number of 75 points, resulting in three wins. What did you mm -hmm. make of the defensive performance as a whole? And how important is it for us getting our defense right? And uh, I guess what have you seen that's changed since that Sydney loss that's almost led to these great defensive performances? That last question, I'm not going to be able, not going to be able to answer well. So I'm going to lean on you for that. It, it makes sense. This has been Vossi's rhetoric since the start, right? Like talking about the defense first approach and that kind of thing. And so it makes a lot of sense that as things come together, it's this that's at the forefront of it. 
I tell you, mate, I watched this game in a rowdy Amsterdam pub with more Essendon supporters than I would oh, have no. liked in that room. Uh, but it was good towards the end. So, But th- things like the, the team defense and what was working strategically was not super clear to me. What do you think it is? Because my instinct would be that we feel like the back six, back seven have been really strong and consistent all year and that it must be work higher up the field. Does that feel right to you? Where do you look at it? It's it's an interesting thing because we spoke about it throughout this season that when we were looking at the ladder, when we were still getting wins, we were just conceding a lot. At one stage, yep. it was like only West Coast, North Melbourne, Hawthorne and Richmond who were like the yeah, bottom four teams. Only them had uh, had scored, had had more scored against them than us like we were that bad we were just yeah. ha- luckily putting enough on the scoreboard to get some wins and we kind of addressed it then saying that this is clearly something that we need to tighten up we have to find a way to sort this out was some of it not having a guy like Fogarty in the forward line you don't mm-hmm. want to just pin it down to one player was it that is it pinning it in the midfield a lot of people were saying is playing those two rucks Mm, was it our yeah. ever shifting back line with with Weedering sort of struggling, playing through some injury, not having McGovern, not having Sard, and what's? Yep. I don't know if I have a specific answer, but I think it's funny that you look at the Gold Coast game where we can they only scored seventy three points. That is when mm-hmm. Sard, Cowan, and Fogarty come back into the side. Port Adelaide the week after they only scored seventy one points. No team changes. That's some continuity that we have not had all season, a no-changes team lineup. Week after, Essendon, 70 points. Only change is Fantasia out to injury, which isn't a massive loss, doesn't change our defensive structure or team defense, really. So the obvious answer right now for me is just key personnel, getting Saad, getting Gov, getting that back six or seven sorted with a, a Cowan in there, not maybe a, a March bank going too tall, getting mm-hmm. Fogarty back in that forward line to, to shape that area up. Zach Williams being a bit more of a pivotal presence down forward. It feels like the structure, yeah. personnel, everything has been working perfectly in almost every single area. And <laughs> it's amazing when those kind of things line up that all of a sudden you don't concede as many points. Yeah. I mean, I feel like we, we saw that coming or we were optimistic about that when it was like okay we're gonna get start getting guys back can we then get continuity which is what we've seen over these last few weeks with minimal injuries mm. and now the buy so yeah that makes sense on on the surface and and mentally it feels like there might be and this is it's hard to really know but it feels like there is a, a higher yeah. degree of desperation out there for every single contest and that was really evident for me mm. this week, particularly in that third quarter when we were struggling, just the amount of desperation yeah. efforts from us to close the gap to make sure that it wasn't an easy possession for Essendon. And even when the midfield themselves were probably down a little bit offensively, still thought they defended really well. And it's amazing mm. once our midfield starts to get that uptick as well, and starts to really dominate games for four quarters, then like, wow, uh, is the opposition even going to get their hands on the footy? <laughs> like, it's, it's going to be incredible to see. Yeah, exactly. O- on the on the midfield thing, I don't know uh, if you picked up something in the game, but Walsh's time on ground, which was lower than Owies, for example. Ooh, really? Um, yeah, he played 72%. So maybe, maybe a good timing that we've got the buy. It felt like... You know, you said the midfield was down. Mm. Obviously, Cripps was getting attention. Maybe there was something for Walsh there. So, good time to have the buy just on that. No, no I think so. And, and, yeah, Walsh is definitely one of those guys that with his limited preseason, everything that was going on with his back, you just wonder if yeah. he is it like, you know, absolutely 100% how long it's going to take him to truly get back to 100. I know his first few weeks from injury, he was looking really good. But maybe he does mm. just need that little bit of a rest taking on a bit more yeah. responsibility without a chair out in the midfield. And I'm sure he'll be back to his best after the bye. So the next Agreed. topic I wanted to address is efficiency. Because while Essendon couldn't hit a barn door, we were absolutely <laughs> clinical. Um, 
I just thought it was terrific from us, something we don't normally do. And, and it wasn't just the efficiency inside 50. It was the generation of just such good looks in front of goal, so unlike us. Yeah. Is that the most clinical performance in front of goal you've seen from us? Oh. And as a follow-up question before I even let you answer it, is is this su- sustainable? Mm. It has to be up there in terms of the best this season. Like such an amalgamation of the entries, the pressure, I think, to keep it in there. Like I'm thinking back to those, like the that barrage of goals at the start of the fourth and where we were kind of getting them. Like just so different to the the little heat map that you showed before or, or thinking about us last year when we were relying on these like outside 50 shots to keep us in games. It's so different when we're getting our shots in there. Sustainable? <laughs> oh, it's just crazy how much better the forward line is functioning mm. with Williams in there, with Fogg in there. Um, yeah, it, it puts questions on the, the guys that can return. It's like, I, I want to hope that it is sustainable. We're getting goals from different avenues. The, the mid-forward connection with Hollands there is just so improved. Um, yeah, let's be optimistic about it. Yeah, I think when you're getting the ball in quick and deep into better areas, uh, I think that that is sustainable because if you're generating better looks at goal, easier shots, easier targets, you're the percentage of you scoring just goes up. And, and when you are able to generate those better chances and then take them then confidence builds. And now all of a sudden you get a few yeah. outside 50 confidence is built throughout the team. You're going to absolutely nail them. And I thought that that was a big thing that I noticed in this game was just our ability to, to put the score on the board early. And then when Essendon start missing a few of their easier shots early in that game, that just starts to build the pressure on yeah. them. And it, and it must've been quite deflating for Essendon uh, sort of confidence wise out on the field when they're struggling to create chances, they finally do. They miss, we go down straight away and kick one. And I loved that they only kicked mm. three goals in the first half of that game. And each of those three yeah. goals, we responded within like a minute of yeah. putting one back on the scoreboard, something that often happens to us. And that's just so, say. that's so deflating. Like, what do you do when that happens? For you, if you if you if you if you're Essendon, you've just worked so hard, finally get a goal, bang, cancelled it out immediately. And I think those little things are just what those really good teams do. And it just there was just so many little things I can take out of this game against Essendon, out of this win, and go, yeah, we really are this top four team because this isn't something yeah. that Carlton's done for for a long time. You nailed it that we are so used to being on the other side of that where it always just feels so hard for us. And then the other team goes and gets an easy one. Mm. And I think there was only one time and it might've been in the last quarter where they finally kicked two goals in a row. Yeah. That's how quick we were to either respond quickly or kill the game off for a few minutes and then finally put one on the board. And when you can't, when you're not allowing your opposition to get consecutive goals, on the board, I mean, that's where you start to yeah. stifle teams and force them into either taking risks and getting turnover or just just putting on too much pressure and they can't handle it. Handle it. So absolutely yeah. love that. Now, obviously, we will talk about the third quarter, but I'm in a positive mood, so I want to keep this going. And <laughs> Obviously, third quarter wasn't amazing, but much like the last few weeks, it was close-ish heading into the last bit of pressure on us. We've got the lead. Can we control this? Can we go into this last quarter, rejuvenate and take this game on for ourselves? We needed to go. And when we needed to, we did. What did you make of that last quarter yeah. in particular, the, the absolute red hot start to it? And, and maybe if you want to highlight a couple of players, mm. absolutely go for it. Yeah, Absolutely. I mean, we, we sound like a broken record talking about the momentum and how, you know, it shifts throughout the game and it's so rare that a team just sustains attack for so, so long. So going into three-quarter time, when I was feeling pretty... I, I turned very quickly from feeling quite down about, like, just how hard they went at us in the third quarter and how 
poor I felt that we were into there's just no I just cannot see this game then going we're going to take the break and it's just going to continue I just felt so much confidence in the boys that they would make it happen that's becoming a bit of a theme for us to to do this now uh, you know in the fourth um yeah incredible like obviously Chincotta is a, a guy to mention who certainly is in my votes for this game once again because yeah not only doing such a pivotal role but also being able to hit the scoreboard um was massive i mean yeah the williams goal got me absolutely completely up and about <laughs> i was out of my seat when i thought that charlie one went through and i had to kind of you know duck duck my head down uh when i realized it hadn't uh, just a leak just a leak to put the game away like that yeah do you think because you mentioned we're kind of making a bit of a habit of it now that when there are these moments of you've really got to just be that better team and take this game. At least over the last month, it feels yeah. like we've been able to do that. Is that something that you you now feel confident with Carlton for the back half of this season, that mm. this is something we can almost depend on, that in these big moments, if it's all square going into that last quarter, they've now got this belief, they've done it, they've got mm. that evidence, this isn't just a bit of hope now, that that is something that can be a bit of a point of difference to take us all the way this year. How are you kind of seeing yeah. that element? Because it hasn't been there all season. There's going to be times that obviously won't swing positively for us. But yeah. now that it's happened a few times in a row, is that a positive? Yeah, I think you're right. I think I think the runs are on the board for in both regards, in terms of that and the holding on to a lead, um, you know, it's not going to be perfect every time. We're still we're still going to get run over the top of sometimes, and we're not going to be able to catch teams at the end. But I'm just feeling so optimistic in almost every regard with this team right now. Like we know it's so hard to go from being a nothing team to going right to the top, and it feels like we've just built our way up over these last couple of years to really be able to do all of these feats. So, yeah. No, absolutely. And the, and the man that I jotted down, because you named a few, absolutely loved what we saw from Chincotti yet again. Um, I'll actually start with him. What did yeah. you make of his role on, on Zach Merritt? Because he, he definitely, yeah. Merritt was struggling early, ended up getting like 21 touches for the game, which I think was his tied season low, which is good. And I don't really feel like he had much of an effect on the mm. contest. How did you see Chincotta's game and how valuable is it? I know we've discussed him a little bit over the last few weeks, but how valuable yeah. is it that he is able to not only shut down his opponent, but then keep hitting the scoreboard, keep doing things positively yeah. for us rather than just being 100% that negative role? Yeah, I mean, that's if you think historically, that's like what the best taggers can do it isn't just the full clamps it is someone that you still have to be accountable for as well which i don't know maybe isn't something that you would have expected because we haven't really seen him get up the ground um when he's been in our afl side like this it just makes me wonder like it seems like the tag is kind of back across the league it's just so crazy how it went away for this mm -hmm. period of time when it just feels so productive to take away a key cog, or at least limit a key cog of an opposition team. And I get the whole, like, you know, we want to play our way, our system. We don't want to be thinking too much about the opposition team. But, man, it's just, it, it is paying so many dividends right now for, for him to be doing that. And, and like you said, if he can then hit the scoreboard and do offensive things, like it wasn't it, and it wasn't just the goals. Like there was a few um, inside 50s that he had that I can remember and that kind of thing. Like, wow, who, who would have thought? I wouldn't have thought this was going to happen six weeks ago. Yeah, it, it's going to be interesting to see how it plays out for the rest of the season now that I think teams will start to have some evidence to go off how we approach the tag, how we are yeah. using it to our advantage. This is when teams start to have a look at the footage, see how they can go around this and, and make it work better for them. So... Now yeah. that we've got the week off, maybe we need to keep evolving this tagging role, find ways to make sure it does work for us because it is so valuable right now. And I'm surprised like you that the tag really went away for a few years. It seemed like something that just needed to evolve where mm. clearly the negating part of it was a bonus. 
but you had to find a way to hurt the opposition the other way rather than just taking away a spot on the ground completely. Feels like that's starting to happen with a few of the players that are having these tagging roles. Chincotta seems to be doing it, particularly when he is a little bit more in the uh, higher part of the ground. You see Jordan doing it for Sydney as well. Some of these taggers, they're able to still win the ball themselves and hurt the opposition. Surprised yeah. it's taken coaches so long to do this. It's it's bizarre. Yeah. Um but another player that we haven't really touched on at all, who kind of he's being able to play such better football because of this tagging role is Elijah Hollands because yeah. he's obviously starting in the midfield. They're kind of switching positions as soon as that center bounce has happened. He's floating forward half the time. Essendon just didn't even think we needed to man him up. And he absolutely hurt him on the scoreboard. What an absolute yeah. steal. This is for what we ended up giving up for him. Losing a guy like Cottrell as well at that high half forward, someone who can hit the scoreboard, not having a Jack Martin. Felt like this could have been a position on field that we may have struggled fixing and sorting out. But, I mean, Elijah has just taken it with with two hands. He's he's been ridiculous. It's everything we hoped it would be when there was rumours that we were going to get him and then when he came and... Yeah, it's 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 everything that we we needed, and as we sat here in the off season last year, it was like that's the that's our one the one thing that if we could just improve on and get a guy to play this kind of role, um, it's amazing. Um, so versatile. Have to remember still how young he is and how much he can still improve from here, which is scary. Yeah, well, that's the crazy thing, and I want to throw this out to you. Do you know how many AFL games he's actually played, Lockie? Oh my god, it would be ridiculous. just have a guess. Have a guess. Like obviously, now that I've teed this up to you, you're going yeah, to I know, you're... lower than I imagined. But even so, yeah. how many games do you think Elijah Hollands has played? Yeah, I would guess it would be twenty-eight. It's twenty-five games. So incredible guess there, but like that is yeah. insane for him to be. And I know That's he's crazy. had a few more years in the system, developing in the twos. Obviously, missed his sort of under eighteen year with the ACL, but still, to only have played twenty-five games of AFL and already starting to give this amount of output. You're not going to get that every week. You don't need to get that every single week. The fact he's got that in his locker, and we've got different avenues yeah. to move the ball in the midfield. In the forward half, I mean, these are the things that we've been crying out for, that mid-forward connection, have other players kicking goals, being a threat. If you stop someone else, a guy like Hollands can bob up. So I'm just so impressed. And we've we've gone through a few players, but probably the most pivotal player, particularly in that last quarter, is, of course, the King. It's his yep. bloody birthday. It was his, the eve of his birthday, Tom DeConing, I mean, 24 yeah. disposals, which was a team high, 17 contested possessions, 11 clearances, six centre clearances, both game high stats there, seven inside 50s, which is a team high, five marks. I mean, what did you make of this man's whole game? And then particularly in that last quarter when we ended up kicking the first four goals and we really needed someone to step up, did you mm. think it was going to be Big Tommy? <laughs> It's just, yeah, he keeps continuing to put in, like, his best ever Carlton performance, seemingly. Like, he just keeps topping it. Um, just like Hollands, it's what we hoped he could become. Um, but, man, yeah, like, I don't even know if a year ago we, if you said that he was going to be putting in consistent bog performances. Like, that even felt kind yeah. of maybe above his ceiling for at least for 2024. Um, crazy and just doing so many different things like you you see his work rate like he's he's the one moving to create the next option as we're moving the ball up the field like working his ass off and obviously the def- the defensive move is another one that people are calling out like just doing the things that you just don't even expect your Ruckman to be doing um, as well as doing all the fundamentals so well mm. yeah no he's confidence is building performances are building and I'm just so happy that these kind of players that we're highlighting just keep continuing to to improve because you need yeah. them to. And at the start of the season when things maybe weren't going as as well as we would have hoped in that middle patch when we had so many injuries, you start to go, okay, we're going to need a few of these players to, to get a bit of an uptick. We're seeing that now, and, and that's absolutely great to see. I, I think, which 
Look, we're going to have a mid-season review episode next week where yes. we go into all these sort of issues and the list and review how things have gone so far this season in a lot more detail. But uh, just on the two rucks, because I know everyone will continue to talk about it, I still think that there's a slight issue in the one ruck because I think when De Koning's not there, we struggle. Like when Kennedy was in there, when Cripps was in there in that third quarter, they just kept giving away free kicks when we really needed that ball locked into our forward half. I think there's a clear problem with whoever is the other Ruckman while De Koning's there. Now, yep. I don't know. If, if you go back to two Ruckman, I think you definitely need De Koning in there as the main Ruck for the majority of time. But yeah, it's definitely going to be an interesting one as the season evolves. Yeah, yeah. I'm not even going to try and put my stamp on that now. It's a it's a complicated yeah. topic. Yeah, we'll definitely get into it a lot in the mid-season review. So Can't we've been wait. positive. We do need to talk about that third quarter when things weren't going our way. Uh, yeah. Essendon, they had the possession dominance and they were – we could not move the ball outside of our D50. It was a lot of pressure on us. The, the back six were, were struggling but doing so well to, to combat it. Couldn't yeah. wrestle the momentum back. A lot of repeat entries from Essendon. Is this a bit of a cause for a concern that when it wasn't going our way, we couldn't wrestle the momentum back in a quarter? How did you kind of mm. see that? Because I know that's probably where the rhetoric yeah. has gone more towards Essendon were unlucky. They just didn't convert. Yeah. You think that we can be allowing teams to have such a long dominance of play and, and how can we arrest that for the rest of the season? Yeah, yeah. I think it is uh, somewhat cause for concern. As I mentioned earlier, I was uh, incredibly frustrated at three-quarter time. I, I felt like even though they only managed to put three goals on us in that quarter, and you can look at that positively, it just felt like we didn't have any way to get out of our half. And it didn't feel like we were trying anything differently to me. And, and feel free to disagree with me if you felt differently. Um, like I was just so sick of the long kick out of our defensive 50, which just was not working ever, ever. And I know all, all we need is one big contested mark from one of the big boys. And suddenly now we're, we're going to be getting it down our way. But it just felt like the, the bold attacking completely went away. Yeah. And maybe, and maybe it's hindsight, but even if we, if I saw us try and do some more risky play to try something different, and if that then resulted in a goal, I still would have at least been like, okay, at least we aren't just doing mm. 10 in a row, Nick Newman, 50 metre kicks out to Ridley. Yeah, I hate when the uh, the old strategy and the old, well, I don't know if there's a name for this down at Carlton, but the old... Okay, kick in, short to Newman in the pocket, long down the line. There has to be some sort of play that they're calling out there, like us in touch rugby back in high school, coming out with a couple of road Stop plays. It. But I don't know. Maybe it's something stupid as if we're struggling and we're going long down the line, hoping for a contested mark or some sort of yeah. stoppage, and it's the 17th time you've done it and the ball keeps going straight back and ping-ponging into the mm. defensive 50, can you do something as dumb as, look, if we're clearly not taking the mark here, set up literally out of bounds and just have Newman kick it and, and the try to land it just inside and then just spoil it out. Now we've actually mm. got a stoppage boundary throw in yeah. on the midway of the ground and hope that we've got a second to breathe. We can sort it out that way rather than hoping to get the mark and win it at ground level when everyone's yeah. flying up. I, I don't know. I don't know if that's, the dumbest thing I've ever suggested, but like just come up with something different if we're just doing the yeah. same thing, repeating it over and over. There was, it's funny when you look at it, part of me was just wanting Essendon to nail one, to actually just put it through the big sticks so we could just set up back again at the center clearance <laughs> because the ball was just coming in so quick, repeat yeah. entries. Our defense didn't get a second to breathe and that was allowing the ball to be hemmed so deep because mm. when you're when you've got that much pressure on you when you're that tired from having to defend constantly you don't get a chance to rest you just have to keep hack kicking it out it goes straight back to Essendon now you're having to find your man when that just keeps happening 
I think it is quite difficult to break out of that. So I, I, part of me wants to give them a little bit of leeway because yeah, how many times does the ball just stay in that spot for so long without a team actually kicking a goal and allowing a proper reset, allowing you to get a couple of players on from the bench, maybe change something up structurally there, get a message out from the coaches. Not sure if that's a positive, a good way to look at it. Um, but yeah, I, it's just so weird that I was like, can Essendon just kick a goal so we can get a second to, to readjust? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I definitely agree with everything you're saying. I mean, just on Newman, um, like it just makes me wonder just about specific roles. Like obviously we've continued to evolve everyone's position in this team and everything like that. I'm, I'm just, I would just wonder whether... 18 kicks from him by far the most of anyone in the team is is really what we want like i, I just wonder mm. whether there's and i have so much faith in in our coaching team to be able to continue to evolve how we do this and that we will improve at it but i just wonder whether there's other guys that potentially can be a little bit bolder potentially maybe a bit more confident to take some shorter passes than these you know, and, and move the ball a bit more systematically. Mm. I just wonder, like we, we talk about, like I'm so happy to see that, you know, Elijah and, and Saad are the, the second and third guys, you know, kicking the most. I just wonder whether there's still more evolution in, in our defenders as well. Yeah, is there scope to, in those moments, just set up a couple of screens to allow a guy like Saad to get five, 10 metres just by running? Yeah. And does that clear distance? It's an interesting thing. And, and I think clearly... When we do get bogged down, that's a problem. It's been a problem for a long time. Hopefully they are clearly working on something to make sure that yeah. that's not happening for a whole quarter. But at least it was good to see us, as we said, step out into that last quarter and really turn things around. It wasn't going to last for too long, but I think we need to head straight into the votes here, Lockie. Sure. Wrap up this beautiful victory. So let's head towards the Navy Blue Corner, Blue Bagger Badge of mm. Honor. Everyone watching, drop your three, two, ones in the comments. If you're listening in audio form, head over to the socials at Navy Blue Corner and let us know your votes. I think there's a clear standout for the three. There's mm. a, a lot of players performed well, so I'm very interested to know where you go with this. And then in our mid-season review, We'll be doing a tally. We'll be getting yes. the calculator out and uh, letting you know what the leaderboard is like. I feel like often with our votes, we focus on a few players throughout the episode and then it's like, oh, yeah, and by the way, obviously this guy gets a vote as well. <laughs> but that's not the case for me this week. I've gone TDK3, Elijah 2, and Chincotta 1. Mm, no, very, very good. I've been very similar. I was actually going to say earlier um, that if you've got – Votes that are different to me. I don't know what game you're watching, but then you said Chin Cotton. I was like, yeah, okay, that's fair enough. <laughs> I can't have a go at you for this, but I've given my three and my two to the exact same players, De Koning and Elijah. But my one vote I gave to George Hewitt because I think particularly mm. in that first half when the rest of the midfielders weren't really doing a lot, thought he was absolutely yeah. everywhere, getting everything moving for us. And he's been a bit down, I think, the last month or two. We've been talking Agreed. about it in little bits here and there on the podcast. So to see him really step up when he needed to, knowing we can rely on someone else if Cripps and Walsh aren't at their best. It's what I love to see. So I thought he deserved the one vote. But now let's jump into another great segment on this podcast. It's the Hall of Fame. Ladies and gentlemen, it is time for the ceremony of ceremonies. Straighten your tie, adjust your monocle, and raise a pinky for the Navy Blue Corner Hall of Fame. Yes, it's the Hall of Fame, and I may have made the tiniest tie of all time. Uh, one off, like, in between us, uh, if you do remember that. And they also have the uh, short tie. That was obviously in vogue. But it was look, a high it's a, it's a, for sure. Exactly. Look, this is a great segment where we get to have a look at some, some very fun things. Now, this has been a very positive segment, I think, for me at least, this season. Uh, I don't want to talk too much about you because I know you've gotten a bit angry a few times this year. So... <laughs> Interestingly, wow. I'm going to be going very negative with who I'm inducting this week. So maybe we need to start wow. with you to give a bit more positivity before we get to a bit more of a traditional Ian rant. So who are you inducting oh. this week, Lockie, into the Hall of Fame? 
Wow, my God, what a setup. It's almost like you're trying to drown out the importance of my one, like to try to build the people up for yours. Let's just get through Lockheed's and then we'll get to yours. Um, mine, it, it's a it's a concept. It's a feeling rather than a person. I like this. I, like this. Um, I mean, I, I, I'm almost certain that I would have inducted this last year um, in a bit of a different sense, though, because it was such a be- it's such a beautiful thing last year being in Melbourne, walking around with your Carlton scarf, your Carlton beanie, and seeing, you know, the fellow baggers out and up and about. But I have to say that it it does hit even more when you're doing it internationally in beautiful Amsterdam. So shout out and inductee to the three separate baggers on Sunday that saw my Carlton scarf after the win, out in the streets, on the train. You don't when, when there's just Dutch all around you and very little English happening, when you hear a big up the baggers from 20 metres away and, and a bloke giving you one of these ones, um, it just hits different. Oh, that, that, see, that's genuine. I'm happy that mine can just be thrown <laughs> away at the end because this is clearly way more important. Uh, I mean, we know the baggers army is absolutely everywhere. To, to know that they're there in the Netherlands is just unbelievable. Yep. Love that for you, Lockie. And, I, and I'm glad there were some Essendon supporters there as well. So you could have yeah. actually ripped into them and sent them packing straight back to oh. Australia. Um, Get angry. Yeah. Mine's a little bit negative. I feel like, and maybe we've got to go back through and see who we have inducted previously. I feel like I've inducted this before. So I'll this could be know. a legend status as well, but... <laughs> <laughs> John Ralph, sir, <laughs> mate. Like, I think this is the first time induction for Johnny. So go off. You just, uh, how many times does this little snide, poor <laughs> excuse for a footy journalist have to come out after the game, after a Carlton game, and he just picks out the most innocuous thing that no one was talking about, and it's the way he prefaces these things. He goes, oh, I'm not saying he should be should be rubbed out. But, um, I mean, there's a little bit of chatter after, after this game. I mean, potentially about uh, Patrick Cripson. I just want to show you an incident here. Now, that, the umpire gave a bit of a dangerous tackle here. Now, he has dumped him. You know, the mm-hmm. AFL will be quite hot on this. Um, again, I'm not saying that he should be uh, reported. But I think we just need – let's just – can we show this again for the hundredth time um, and make sure that there's a lot of articles about this. Get this pumping in the media. Uh, Paddy Cripps suspended. Like, mate, this is about the hundredth time he has picked out the shittiest, clearly not suspendable incident for a Carlton player. It's like he's got some genuine vendetta against us at this stage because I just cannot believe he's gone again. It's such an innocuous thing. Like, if you're going to do it, at least have the balls and be like, I'm trying to get this guy reported. Let's just see if we can do it again. (laughs) We certainly need a separate wing of the Hall of Fame for inductees like this because it... (laughs) You know, it doesn't deserve to have the fame status. Um, yeah. The, the one thing for me is I, it's kind of Tom Brown-esque in the past where I, I don't know whether this is a conscious thing. Like, do you think do you think this is like a targeted intentional thing or is this just who he is as a journalist? Look, I put my nuffy hat on for this and said he absolutely is. He hates Carlton and there's some vendetta against yeah. it. Realistically, I don't think he's actually consciously doing it. But, like, I, I'm just... When it happens so many times, you start to I get know. the cork board out. You start connecting everything with a bit of string. <laughs> it's it's getting ridiculous him? now that he's doing this. I don't know what's happened. But I also hate that he did it from, like, inside the Carlton rooms. Like, I would have loved if yeah, Cripper that... just slowly walks up behind him and just, like, into the frame of the camera. And he's like, you good, Johnny? And then he's like, oh, oh, oh cancel that, boys. Don't worry about it. Like, really just start to intimidate him. Uh, it's bizarre. Oh. I mean, honorable mention because... Speaking of journos, I just thought then someone who yeah. almost could have been inducted was was Todd Morris, who somehow got his Twitter account yeah, hacked right. out fourteen times in about one hour. Don't know how he managed to do that. One of one of the uh, the absolute greats from Big Tommy. Yeah, you get a password, buddy. What are you doing? <laughs> I only saw a couple of the like the hacked tweets, and it was a they missed could have done. Oh. oh my god! Like could have done so much better. Like surely you would lead with like. I'm going to try and be genuine yeah. here and get people to think that this is like, come on now. Yeah. Poor yeah I mean, it was clearly the bloke who did it was like 10 years old and yeah. has, isn't smart enough. Cause yeah, you wanted to break some breaking news that felt plausible. See right. what happens. 
Let it settle for an hour. Do it again later. Bevo sat something in, in those oh, in that realm. Good, make up a bit of a graphic and oh man, it could have been could have been spicy. <laughs> oh, what a wasted opportunity. But that is the Hall of Fame this week. Um, now before we wrap up this episode, and, and like I mentioned, we will have a big mid-season review episode hitting next week, along with a build-up, yes. of course. Later in the week uh, for that uh, Geelong game. Don't worry, we're not going anywhere. And we're going to be going through the list, maybe a little bit of a look at who can come into the team once we're fully fit, how things have gone so far this season. If you've got any questions, anything you want us to cover mid-season, let us know. Very excited for that. But before we do it, we need to do a little bit of a reflection. now. My favourite. There's two reflections I want to touch on. One is just a a quick one that, look, 12 months ago, Lockie, this time last year, this fixture last year was pretty much rock bottom for us. We've just lost to Essendon, four wins, nine losses, another poor showing, things were rock bottom. It was, we couldn't score, everything was bad. Was it another sack the coach? Was it another rebuild? It was another failure from the club. That's what it felt like. Now, 12 months on, a lot has changed. We've just defeated the Bombers. We're sitting second on the ladder in the exact reverse. We're nine and four. In that period, we've had 18 wins, five losses in the regular season. That's 20 wins and six losses overall when you throw in finals. Made a prelim, so close to a grand final. Lucky, just wanted to reflect on this because mm. it's been a long time coming. What sort of comes to mind for you when you look back and reflect on yeah. really where we've come from and, and what we've been able to accomplish in this uh, last 12 months? And I guess what it's all kind of meant to you as well, to get a little sentimental. Oh, I love it. I, well, speaking of sentimental, I feel like firstly, before we record the mid-season review, you and I should sit down and watch some of the, you know, some parts of like that Essendon review last year, mm. for example, and, and just to see where the headspace was at because I can I could just picture how incredibly grim it was and and how and how bad we were feeling about it all um and I guess maybe to be not as optimistic for a second and I think Vossi mentioned it in in his press out like it, it shows how quickly things can change for the better or worse so this isn't to say that we're gonna finish second <laughs> at the end of this season Really, yeah. and it's all just, it all just is a testament to like living in the moment and enjoying it week by week. Because, yeah, if, you, if you're so, I feel like we spoke about this last year, if you're so fixated on finals and that end, the end thing, then you, you get caught up mm. not enjoying mm. the, the current. So, I think, I think right now we're doing a good job of not mm. trying to forecast too much and, I'm really enjoying every win. And and yeah, I mean, we, how many times have we said this throughout the life of this podcast? And it's happened during the podcast. These years that we would win two games of footy. Um, <laughs> Abysmal. <laughs> and like, and, and this is where we are now. So it's, it's special. Yeah, no, I think even some part of the back end of last season. Obviously, it was amazing that run we went on, but there was even just a little part of you that with each game, you you, you get the win, you, you live it for those few sort of hours after the game, and then your mind kind of went, shit, we've got to win the next one. Like, you yeah, can't almost enjoy that. it for too long because of the position we put ourselves into. Whereas, yeah, this year it's been a lot more of a mature thing, I think, from the fan base where we are just enjoying these wins. And even when things seemingly went a bit pear-shaped with some injuries, there's some degree of meltdown. But overall, I think for the most part, the supporters were, okay, next week, what's going to happen with this next game? And taking it one week at a time, even now, second on the ladder, absolutely flying. And no one's being like, okay, premiership, it's got to be this. It's just, okay, it's Geelong. Yeah. Let's worry about this game. Let's worry about who's available. Get that done. Then the next week. And I think that's a lot. And I think yeah. the perspective that we've gained from it, the just the memories we've been able to gain is incredible. And it's insane how quickly things can turn for you. And, and just, yeah, yeah, I mean, it's it's insane to think. And I, I did have a quick look. I wanted to see if there was some sort of absolute disgraceful tweet from myself uh, off the, oh, the podcast been, accounts I'm sure. after the Essendon game to be like, what did I tweet? And can I 
retweet it and be like, wow, look at just look at what's changed in a year. And surprisingly, it was very subdued. It was just, it was really? like sending you, it was like, it was something along the lines of like, that was awful. Send in your questions if you've got any, blah, blah, blah. Clubs cooked. That's all it said. And I was like, gee, that's pretty tame for what I was feeling at the time. Obviously, I was just that checked out that you couldn't even get me to really throw too much out there on the socials. So, yeah, uh, that was very interesting. Definitely wasn't feeling as uh, yeah as good as that tweet maybe seemed. But now that we've reflected on that and, I mean, drop in the comments. I want to know how people are feeling after a big year and, and just what the 12 months has been. And, yeah, I mean, just drop your thoughts, drop your memories. That's what we want to talk about. A lot of fun stuff. We, we do need to reflect on the last three games. We've been doing this, this run of three fixtures throughout the season. Now, we've just yeah. played... Gold Coast, Port Adelaide, and Essendon. We were saying going into this, we needed, look, two and one was the worst case scenario that we were willing to accept. Um, but after we went one and two from our previous three fixtures, to be that top four team, to be the true contender, we needed to go three and zero. We got our wish. We got the three wins without going into too much of the mm. overall nine and four record because that's what we're going to discuss in depth in the mid-season review episode next week. Yeah. How important was getting those three wins and, and what does it mean for us going forward? I think I think it would make a massive difference to the boys going into the bye. Like I feel like the confidence that they would have got from this little stretch after the Sydney game, just puts, puts a bit of a different light on, I think, how we'll be able to, you know, how, how they'll be able to take the time to get away from footy, as they've spoken about, and, and that kind of thing. It just kind of shapes the end of the season in a different way. And as you as you pointed out, for us as supporters, it, it, it makes, it paints a different light on it as well, where hopefully we will be able to keep, keep this kind of week-by-week week mindset. Mm. Um yeah, we were optimistic, optimistic for a three and zero, but it, it didn't feel like the likely outcome. So we're very, we're very fortunate. No, one hundred percent. I think you nailed it. Like that momentum, and probably as well, just the mood around the place heading into right. the buy. Being able to go in with some positive energy is is absolutely massive. Now you can enjoy the week off. You don't have to worry going. Oh no, where are we on the ladder? How tough is this run home going to be? You can just mm. take that time off and then get back into it for a very big game against Geelong. And I think what I'm impressed with is just that we're still not at our best and we weren't at our best in these three wins. We still clearly have rooms, room to grow, areas that we need to improve on and, and areas I think we definitely can. But we did enough to get those victories. We beat Port over in Adelaide, something we haven't done for a long time. Brush that off. We, we beat Essendon, which, you know, was yeah. one of the teams we, we probably hadn't beaten since last season. Get that monkey off the back there. All the momentum was was with them. So that was absolutely nice to do. And looking at the ladder and d delving into that as well, you just simply couldn't start to be that team that falls off. It's so tight amongst everyone right now that, that's why it was so vital to get those three wins out of those three games rather than a two and one or, or God forbid you, you lose more than you win there because yeah. you need to be that team that starts to break away with Sydney that is spoken about there rather than being the team that, okay, we lose one or two of those games and straight after the bye, it's okay, now we're having to get back into the eight again and the pressure starts building. So to have that mm. slight pressure off, no one's talking about us, we can relax for a week off, Enjoy the break. Mood is high. Uh, this is the perfect spot to be. And then, yeah, recharge and go again back after the year. Pretty tough not to be feeling pretty damn positive about, about where we're at right now. Absolutely. And, and we're always ridiculously positive, so that's how you're going to that's find true. it with us. But, yes, that is going to basically wrap up this episode here. Hope you've enjoyed it. It's always great to talk about a win against Essendon. God, I just... I'm so happy it was built up as them being a good team and we just got to show, no, you're still shit. And uh, back half of the season, 
will prove exactly what they are. But like we said throughout this episode, we'll be back next week with a mid-season review episode. Probably going to drop around, I would say, Monday morning, Monday night on our own YouTube channel, which will be linked in the show notes if you want to watch it. If you're listening in audio podcast form, it'll be available wherever you listen to them. And then, of course, we'll be back on Blue Abroad for a Geelong build-up show. It's going to be a big one. Plenty to talk about. If there's anything you want us to cover, any big questions you have, for the mid-season, drop them in the comments. Head over to the socials at Navy Blue Corner. Let us know all about it, and we will make sure to add to it and have a massive, massive mid-season review. God, it's a good time to be a Carlton supporter. Up the bloody baggers. See you guys next time.